the slaughtered lamb. That's kind of strange. No, really. What kind of ad is that for a pub? Hello to all the classic tribe that is returning. I'm glad you're back. I want to welcome any new visitors. As a technical note, references and citations are listed for each show on the site at classicmovierev.com. Today on the Classic Movie Review Podcast, we are taking on the classic horror film, An American Werewolf in London, 1981, because it is October. This movie was directed and written by the great comedy director John Landis. It won an Oscar for Best Makeup by Rick Baker. Baker wasn't happy with how little his creation was shown, but I guess Landis knew what he was doing. This movie has a surprisingly low 7.5 rating on imdb.com. On RottenTomatoes.com, it has an 87% on the tomato meter and 85% audience approval. The great film critic Roger Ebert didn't care for the movie, saying, quote, An American werewolf in London seems curiously unfinished as if the director John Landis spent all his energy on spectacular set pieces and didn't want to bother with things like transition, character development, or an ending, unquote. Sadly, in 1997, a sequel titled An American Werewolf in Paris was made. It was terrible. I didn't even make it all the way through. Actors. Right, and I'm a Shakespearean actor. David Naughton played the role of David Kessler. Lycanthrope. He was born in Connecticut in 1951. Naughton graduated from the University of Pennsylvania and he later studied at the London Academy of Music and Dramatic Arts. He had his professional debut at a Lincoln Center production of Hamlet. He got a lot of attention as a singer and a dancer in a Dr. Pepper commercial. He had a minor disco hit in 1979 with Making It. Insert joke. His biggest role was in An American Werewolf in London, 1981. He continued to work in movies and television, but has not had another major hit film. Griffin Dunn played Jack Goodman, who is the comic relief and the life of the movie. Dunn was born in 1955 in New York City. I'm walking here! I'm walking here! His father was actor-producer Dominique Dunn. He grew up in Los Angeles and in Colorado, but moved to New York after high school. He studied at the H.P. Studio in New York City. He had very little film experience when he was cast in An American Werewolf in London, 1981, where he was great. Other movies include After Hours, 1985, Running on Empty, 1988, White Palace, 1990, Once Around, 1991, My Girl, 1991, I Like It Like That, 1994, Dallas Buyers Club, 2013, and Movie 43, 2013. He began directing with a short, The Duke of Groove, 1996, where he received an Oscar nomination. He did very well with films such as Addicted to Love, 1997, Practical Magic, 1998, Lisa Picard is Famous, 2000, Fierce People, 2005, and Game 6, 2005. Jenny Gutter was sexy nurse Alex Price. Jenny was born in 1952 in England. A Gutter's first film was at age 12 with East of Sudan, 1964. She then went to work for Disney for a time. The best of her younger work was The Railway Children, 1970, and A War of Children, 1972. Her bigger roles came in the late 1970s with films like Logan's Run, 1976, The Made for Television, The Man in the Iron Mask, 1977, the Eagle Has Landed, 1976, and An American Werewolf in London, 1981. For the next two decades, she worked in film and on television. Story. Let me explain. No, there is too much. Let me sum up. The Northern English landscape is shown as Blue Moon by Bobby Vinton plays. David Kessler, David Naughton, and his pal Jack Goodman, Griffin Dunn, are hiking and hitchhiking. Jack, who is a really funny guy, is not happy about being in such a cold climate. They unload from a truck full of sheep, and the driver tells him to stick to the road and stay off the moors. Boys, keep off the moors. Stick to the roads. They plan on going to Italy later, where it's warmer. Jack is worried about meeting a girl named Debbie Klein, who is in Italy. Those sheep shit in my pack. 
They walk down the road to a small town. It is dark by the time they arrive. They find a small pub named The Slaughtered Lamb, which has a wolf head on a pike with a full moon behind it. The Slaughtered Lamb? That's kind of strange. Where's the lamb? It's probably inside getting cold. Come on. No, really. What kind of ad is that for a pub? They go inside and everyone goes silent. They sit down under the stairs and are waited on. Jack notes there's a five-pointed star with drippy candles on both sides. David jokes that maybe the owners are from Texas and says, Remember the Alamo. The locals start talking about how bad the Alamo 1960 starring John Wayne really is. The tension eases a bit. Jack tells David that the star is a pentangle that is used in witchcraft and that Lon Chaney Jr. and Universal Studios maintain that it's a symbol of the mark of the werewolf. See, because Jack knows his movies. Then Jack asks what's the star on the wall for. <laughs> Excuse me. What's that star on the wall for? The men turn hostile and they insist that they leave but the lady gives them a little defense. They are warned to stay on the road and keep off the moors. They are also told to beware of the moon. Beware the moon, lads. They head out of town looking for food and maybe a place to stay. Back at the pub, the locals are still discussing letting them go and that it is murder. One of the men says they shouldn't let outsiders know of the local business. In a rainstorm, Jack and David wander off the road and onto the moors. The debate is still going on in the pub when howls are heard in the distance. David and Jack are concerned about the howling. Did you hear that? I heard that. What was it? Could be a lot of things. Yeah? The coyote. There aren't any coyotes in England. The hound of the Baskervilles? They mention the hounds of the Baskervilles and Heathcliff of Wuthering Heights because he was on the moors. Jack sees the full moon, and they realize they've gotten off the road. They begin trying to get back to the town, but realize they are lost. The howling sound is circling them. Finally, they start running. David falls down, and Jack reaches to help. Suddenly, a werewolf leaps in and tears Jack's throat out. David runs away, but then turns to go help his friend, who is being torn apart. Jack is dead when David gets there. The werewolf attacks him. Before the monster can finish him off, men from the town shoot and kill the monster. The wounded David sees a nude man that has been shot beside him before he passes out. Sexy nurse Alex Price, Jenny Agutter, is in the hospital room when David wakes, calling for his friend Jack. David is still in a coma when Dr. J.S. Hirsch, John Woodbine, comes to check on him. Hurst says the police report said Jack and David were attacked by an escaped lunatic. In David's head, he's having visions of running through the woods. The voice of the doctor wakes David. David asks about Jack. David freaks a little as the U.S. Embassy man talks to him. Nurse Price gives him a sedative. Before he passes out, he is told he has been there for three weeks. David tells them it was a wolf and not a man that attacked him. Inspector Villaries, Don Killup, and his bumbling sidekick, Sergeant McManus, Paul Kimber, of Scotland Yard, come to interview the doctor. They go to see David, and he sticks with his story that he was attacked by an animal. The police say the matter is closed. Jack thinks he may be going crazy, as he keeps seeing himself running naked through the woods and killing a deer with his bare hands before eating the animal. Nurse Price is keeping a special eye on David. David is not eating his food. She sits on the bed and starts feeding him. Again, David dreams he is running through the woods, dressed as he was the night of the attack. He sees himself in a hospital bed, in the forest, with Alex looking over him. The bed version of himself turns into a yellow-eyed, white-faced, fanged monster. He tells the doctor about his vivid dreams. David tries to convince the doctor to help, but the man refuses. David asks for someone to sit with him, and they send Alex. David tells her she is beautiful. Alex reads to him and David dreams of his home. He and his family are watching TV when a knock is heard at the door. Zombie Nazis come in and shoot the entire family and force him to watch before slitting his throat. He wakes and tells Alex he had a nightmare. 
She goes to open the curtains, and another zombie Nazi starts stabbing her. He wakes up for real, and is just a little bit freaked out. His breakfast is brought in, and before long, he sees the animated, shredded body of his friend Jack. Jack says he had to come. Jack talks about Debbie Klein crying at the funeral, then running off with another guy. Can I have a piece of toast? Get the fuck out of here, Jack. David! You're hurting my feelings. David! What? Now, I'm really sorry to be upsetting you, but I have to warn you. Warn me? We were attacked by a werewolf. I'm not listening to this. On the moors, we were attacked by a lycanthrope. A werewolf. I was murdered. An unnatural death. And now I walk the earth in limbo until the werewolf's curse is lifted. Shut up. The wolf's bloodline must be severed. Take your life, David. Kill yourself before you kill others. Jack gives a warning and says they were attacked by a werewolf. He says he will have to walk the earth in limbo until the last werewolf is destroyed and that David is the last werewolf. Jack asks David to kill himself before he kills others. Jack repeats the line, beware the moon. Alex comes in and Jack disappears. David kisses her and then announces he is a werewolf. He tells her his dead friend was there and told him he will be a werewolf in two days. Alex convinces him it's another vivid dream. Alex then invites this guy to stay at her house. She must be a sucker for a hard case. They pick up food and ride the tube back to her flat. Ah, she has a Casablanca 1942 poster on the wall. She shows him the bed and said it's not her habit to pick up stray Americans. She gives her entire sexual history. They end up in the shower all kissy face while Moon Dance by Van Morrison plays. Later, David leaves the bed and runs into Jack in the bathroom. Jack looks much worse. Jack tells him that the next night is the full moon and he will change into a werewolf. What are you doing here? I wanted to see you. I'm sorry I'm upsetting you, David, but you don't understand what's going on. I understand, all right. You're one of the undead, and I'm a werewolf. Yes, that's right. Tomorrow night's the full moon. You're going to change. You'll become... I know. I know. A monster. You've got to kill yourself, David. He advises him to kill himself before it's too late. David doesn't believe Jack is real. When Alex wakes up, Jack leaves. She brings David back to bed. In the discussion about David being crazy, David brings up The Wolfman, 1941. Alex thinks it's all funny. Dr. Hirsch drives up to the town where the attack took place. He goes into the slaughtered lamb and starts asking questions. The locals are very evasive. He asks about the pentagram and is told that it has been there for 200 years. So what's that? Oh, that's uh, been there for 200 years. Uh, we were going to paint it out, but uh, it's traditional, so we left it. Hirsch mentions werewolves and the locals get hostile. Hirsch goes outside and one man from the bar is standing in the churchyard. He tells the doctor that David is in danger and it was a mistake to let them leave. He says David will change on the full moon. Another man from the bar comes out and screams, that's enough. Alex has to go to work and she leaves David at home alone. David has locked himself out and has to climb in a window. A dog barks at him and a cat arches and hisses at him. Inside, David examines his teeth. He turns on the television and finds naughty Nina, Nina Carter, in News of the World. Carter was married to Rick Wakeman of the band Yes. To the tune of Creedence Clearwater Revival, Bad Moon Rising, David is bored and not hungry. He wanders around the apartment looking like a caged animal. As night falls and the moon rises, the song changes to Blue Moon by Sam Cooke. David screams out in pain and begins ripping his clothes off. It is probably the best transformation scene ever. His hands stretch to a paw as hair grows all over. The bones crack as he transforms into a quadrupedal werewolf. A lot of these techniques were reused by Michael Jackson for the thriller video hiring John Landis to direct, and Rick Baker for makeup in the 1983 shoot. A lot of David's transformations were shot with his head sticking out a hole, surrounded by foam and hair werewolf parts. Later, he can be heard howling. A young couple is going to see friends. 
They go to the back of the apartment to scare their friends. The werewolf attacks and kills the two. Dr. Hirsch returns to the hospital to talk to Alex about David. The doctor tries to call Alex's flat. Of course, David is not there. Hirsch thinks David is in danger and will believe he is a werewolf. Hirsch calls the police. David as the werewolf kills three homeless men by the river. Apparently, the details of the attack were cut because they were too graphic. Another man is killed in the tube station. Just before he is attacked, he is by a poster for See You Next Wednesday, a non-stop orgy. In the morning, David wakes nude in the wolf pen at the local zoo. Alex is in contact with Hirsch, but David has not come back. He steals some balloons from a small boy for cover. Yes, sir? A naked American man stole my balloons. What? And then he steals a red lady's coat. Hirsch reads in the newspaper about the killings and dismemberments. David shows back up at Alex's flat and tells her he woke up in the zoo. She takes it all very well. He kisses her, but shouldn't he have bloody werewolf breath? Hirsch calls and tells Alex about the murders. Hirsch orders her to bring David to the hospital. David is feeling really frisky, but she gets him into a cab. The driver starts talking about the murders and the demon barber of Fleet Street. David has the cab pull over, and he runs away as Alex chases him. David tries to get a bobby to arrest him. Queen Elizabeth is a man! Prince Charles is a faggot! Winston Churchill was full of shit! That's enough! No! David, me. please! Shakespeare's French! But the cop is too nice. David tells Alex he loves her, but he thinks he did some terrible things. Hirsch and Alex meet with Scotland Yard folks, but they are not much help. David makes a collect call to America, but his parents are not at home. He asks his little sister to tell his parents that he loves them and his brother and sister as well. After the call, he tries to slit his wrist with a little pocket knife, but he cannot go through with it. Across the road, he sees Jack standing outside of a porno theater where See You Next Wednesday is playing. Jack looks much worse. David follows Jack into the theater. David sits next to his rotting friend as the movie plays in the background. Hi, Jack. Hi, David. What are you doing here? You promised never to do this kind of thing again. I never promised you any such thing. Not you, you Twitter. I've never seen you before in my life. Oh, sorry. Good movie. Aren't you going to say I told you so? If I were still alive, I probably would. But I did tell you so, you schmuck. They talk for a minute, and then Jack introduces the people David killed the night before. For the most part, the dead people are very harsh on David. This is Gerald Bringsley. Gerald's the man you murdered on the subway. We thought it best for you not to see him, as he's a fresh kill and still pretty messy. Yes. I do look most unpleasant. Why are you doing this to me? This isn't Mr. Goodman's idea. He's your good friend, whereas I am a victim of your carnivorous lunar activities. You must die. They tell him he must take his own life. Then they all discuss ways David could kill himself. David mentions the need for a silver bullet, and the seven people scoff at him. While David is in the theater, night falls and the moon begins to rise. David starts to go through the transformation, and it's not so different from the normal noises of the place. The ticket lady is screaming that there is a mad dog in the theater tearing people apart. A bobby goes in and finds the mutilated parts with the werewolf eating one of the bodies. They pull the sliding door down, temporarily trapping the werewolf, and request rifles be brought in. The werewolf jumps through the door and rips the head of Inspector Villaries off. The werewolf heads into Piccadilly Circus, snapping and causing mayhem. Hirsch gets Alex, and they head to the scene of the carnage. The police trap the werewolf on a dead-end street. Alex jumps from the cab and runs to the scene with the doctor in close pursuit. Police with rifles have shown up, but Alex breaks through and runs down the alley. Alex comes face to face with the werewolf. She warns the werewolf that they are going to kill him. She says she loves him and wants to help. The werewolf unsnarls its snout 
as if it understands. David. They're going to kill you. David. Please. Please let me help you. I love you, David. Before leaping towards Alex's throat, the police fire and the naked David is shown shot and dead in human form. Then Blue Moon by the Marcells kicks in as the credits roll. I'll be right back with the conclusions and the world-famous short summary following a word from our sponsors. Summary. This movie came out with a spate of werewolf movies that include Wolfen 1981, The Howling 1981, Full Moon High 1981, The Company of Wolves 1984, Teen Wolf 1985, Howling 2, Your Sister is a Werewolf 1985, Teen Wolf 2 1987, the movie that almost permanently tanked Justin Bateman's career, and Howling 3 1987. In 1983, Coors Light Beer introduced the Beer Wolf. The marketing gimmick lasted until circa 1992. There must be a connection, but I'm not sure what it is. Something in the water? The 40th anniversary of The Wolfman, 1941? The most interesting thing I found out while researching this movie was that in 1539, Protestant reformer Martin Luther accused the Pope of being a beer wolf, another name for a werewolf. Whatever, a beer wolf sounds like a great guy to hang out with. Film director and writer John Landis got the idea for this movie when he was in Yugoslavia working on Kelly's Heroes 1970. He saw a group of gypsies burying a body very deeply and covering it with garlic so it would not rise from the grave. According to imdb.com, a fan theory says David and the first werewolf never physically changed. The werewolf is what the person thinks they look like. In the first werewolf killing, he is not shown changing back into a human. Also, when David was killed as a werewolf, Alex did not have a reaction to him changing from wolf to man. So in their theory, the change is a metaphor for David going insane after seeing Jack kill. There's a lot in this movie about alienation. The two bulky jackets that Jack and David wore made them look like aliens in Tweed land. Maybe it was just 80s fashion. When David is locked out of Alex's flat, he is becoming more distant from humanity. That is when the dog and the cat act viciously when they encounter him. Of course, waking up in the zoo places David in a liminal state. Joshua Rothkopf of Rolling Stone magazine went further, saying the film was an example of an Quote, allegory of exercise Jewishness, unquote. I don't know if I'd go that far, but it's an interesting idea as a lot of Yiddish is used in the film. There are menorahs and a good bit of talk about circumcision. World famous short summary, beware the Moors. Really. Hope you enjoyed today's show. You can find connections to social media and email on the site at classicmovierev.com or in the podcast show notes. If you enjoyed the show, go ahead and hit the subscribe button. If you've already subscribed, you can tell a friend, colleague, or family member about the show or leave a review at Apple Podcasts. It really helps the show get found. If you want to comment, suggest a movie, or help out, contact me by email at jec at classicmovierev.com. Beware the moors. <laughs>